Right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, sorry, we're a couple of minutes late here today. Um, get my chair at the right height. Right. Okay. Here I am. Um, yeah. Sorry about that. Slight technical hitch. I had to reboot the computer about thirty seconds before I was due to log in. Um, okay. I've got uh, some uh, interesting stuff for you today. Um, the um, first up, I will be talking here about uh, Norton again. Um, we'll then have a, a piece on CE approved clothing and uh, basically how much value you can expect to get out of a, a, an A rated suit. And um, the other story I've got for you is about new middleweight Africa twin. Uh, so we'll, we'll kick on. Um, so good morning and welcome to Elevens is again. Um, you're watching Kevin Williams of Survival Skills, and I'll be bringing you some topical news, some controversial views, and uh, some biking tips on my regular show. Um, here in London, it's a bit of a grey, miserable day. First one we've had since down again, which is probably a good thing, really. Uh, the weather's been kind, and that sort of cheers people up. But uh, anyway, let's uh, let's move on. Um, don't forget, um, I'm happy to take comments. Uh, if you just pop your comment up, that uh, will be great. Um, but I will get back to you at the end of the show. Uh, obviously, while I'm talking, it's a little bit difficult to type onto the computer at the same time. So, okay. Uh, so let's uh, crack on then. Um, the first uh, item again is all about Norton. Um, what's going on with Norton? Well, uh, we know they're in uh, administration. We know that uh, there are problems with uh, pension funds, which have apparently been set up by uh, Stuart Garner. Um, the um, the story continues to develop. Um, it, it appears that an Indian manufacturer called Kinetic had actually been interested in buying the uh, the group of companies which are owned by uh, Stuart Garner, or at least he was the CEO. He's now resigned. Um, the problem is that uh, they seem to have withdrawn their offer, um, and the reason for that seems to be because they have. Uh, discovered the scale of the debts um the the company itself norton motorcycles went into administration in january and apparently owes 28 million to creditors um the next thing that uh, uh it evolved from this story which i mentioned i think it was yesterday in fact was that the uh, norton have actually sold the tooling and the manufacturing rights to the 961 engine which remembers their sort of kind of bread and butter model they've sold those already to a chinese company called jin lang um kinetic who are an indian company as i said they hold the right to manufacture and distribute Norton Southeast Asia motorcycles. And they had expressed an interest in actually buying the company complete. Um, but it appears that the debts uh, are actually even bigger than the um, well, obvious that were clear at the beginning, the 28 million owed to the creditors. It seems that Norton, in fact, has in debts in a total of 40 millions. So, um, Basically, they're not in a position to take on um, anything like that. And the, the, the question is that exactly what Norton owns and what Norton owes is rather complex because there is a, a sort of a web of interconnected companies and, and third party deals which apparently have been done. Um, Full details of those haven't yet come out, but basically it means that it looks like anybody buying the Norton name uh, wouldn't actually have the exclusive rights over it. So, you know, Kinetic, obviously, if they wanted 
promote not build Nortons themselves under the name and badge them up and sell them on as Nortons. If they haven't got exclusive rights to that name, that makes things extremely complicated. So um, it looks like Kinetic are pulling out of that particular um, proposal completely. Um, meanwhile, um, as I've mentioned a couple of times, the pension pot situation um, has been uh, looked at by the pensions ombudsman. Um, the people have been left in seriously out of pocket in at least one case somebody is owed over a hundred thousand um, pounds so apparently seven thousand four hundred people have now signed a petition calling on the government to uh, face a an inquiry um, to force an inquiry on Ghana uh, about what happened to their pension money. Okay, so all right, um, sorry a little bit confused explanation there because the situation is actually rather complicated and it seems to be almost evolving as uh, we speak there are more and more stories coming out uh, almost on a daily basis here and it's difficult to actually catch up with what's happening and who's where so just a quick reminder you are watching kevin williams here uh, with 11s is um, and still to come um, i'm just going to We'll be talking at the end of the show about CE Level A and uh, what you can expect to get for it. Um, and now, basically, just a quick talk about the middleweight Africa Twin. Now, it appears, this is, again, new story that's coming out, that Honda seems to be working on this um, medium weight version of their best-selling big adventure bike. Now, um, the sources quoted in Motorcycle News say that uh, this new Africa Twin model will be one of three new machines. Now, it will be based on the NC modular platform. Um, now, if you um, followed my blog some years ago, I test rode one of the early NC 700s. And... Um, whilst I kind of liked the bike, I did feel it was a little bit underpowered. Um, and there were some issues, I thought, with the gearing as well, because it was derived from the jazz engine. Um, two cylinders chopped off the jazz and converted into a motorcycle engine. I'm sure it's an awful lot more complicated than that. And I'm sure there's not a lot, actually, that is really all that similar between the two. But hey-ho, it was a good marketing spiel to tell people they were buying part of a a very reliable car engine in their motorcycle but the really key point was that the design was what's called modular in other words there was a, a frame and the engine uh, that is basically what's known as a platform and onto that were bolted various different arrangements of seat uh, dummy tank handlebars bodywork and what that eventually came out of this was a range of different bikes um the initial three machines that were released were a straightforward sort of naked roadster. Um, the adventure bike model with uh, the, N the X uh, suffix, which has got the higher bars and the little screen and the sort of the uh, conventional sort of beak and uh, sort of off-roady, half off-road style tires. Um, and the scooter which was an interesting derivative um the low slung engine in the nc allowed a sort of scooter scooter design with the uh, the backbone frame sweeping down very low so it was a kind of almost a step through um and what followed some years after that was a fourth sort of custom version so the the, the platform itself has become a the basis for a, a range of different machines very versatile Okay, now the original 700, um, surprisingly, didn't last all that long in that format. Uh, Honda rather quickly, probably because of a lot of um, comments uh, being, I won't, I won't say critical, but flagging up the, the weaknesses of the motor, very quickly brought out a 750 version. And if you've been following my Facebook page or my blog, you'll know, in fact, that uh, just over six weeks ago, I had an extended ride on the uh, NC750X over in California, um, brand new 2019 model as it happens, um, which uh, my brother just happened to have bought just a few weeks earlier. So I had a day out on that bike and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, and I honestly felt that there were some significant upgrades to that. Um, 
So it was interesting to see that they'll bring out a sort of an Africa twin eyesed version of the NC. Now, there are there is an argument uh, that there's a big gap in Honda's range. They've got the uh, little CR2 uh, 5450, which are really much off-road focused. Um, they're not really road bikes. You can ride them on the road like any motorcycle, but they're, they're really focused for off-road riding. And then at the top end, you've got the big uh, Africa Twin, which started off as a 1,000cc, now grown to an 1,100. Um, and... Whilst a lot of people like that machine, I've never ridden one myself, so I'm not talking from personal experience. Um, equally, um, I've, I've friends who have ridden one. My brother actually test rode one, and he just said it was too big and too bulky. And he's six foot, so you know he's not he's not a small guy. Um, he ultimately plumped for the NC because it was more manageable. Um, so the, for every rider who wants one of those big, really chunky off-road machines. There's somebody else who's looking for something a little bit easier to ride, a little bit more manageable. And so there's a big hole in the uh, Honda range for one of these machines. And this is where the NC platform comes in because the um, the middleweight adventure bike that Honda had around for many years, the Transalp that you might remember, started off as a 600 and then grew through a 650 to a 700 eventually um it were it got very very long in the teeth the uh the engine was basically uh designed around the old vt500 which dates back all the way to i think 1981 or 82 if my memory serves me right so that motor by the time that bike was finally retired was over 30 years old incredible length of time for a motor to hang around if you think about it um people were complaining that old british bikes were ancient uh, by the 70s but uh, you know uh, we're talking a similar kind of uh, lifestyle, lifespan rather, for that particular engine. Anyway, so since the Transalp has disappeared, there's been a, a big hole for a, a middling-sized bike. Um, other manufacturers have stepped in. Um, you can find the the Versus, which is a sort of uh, it's not an adventure bike as such, but it's you know sort of adventure bike styled. Um, there's the mt07 based tracer from yamaha um have a look around and you'll find various other sort of machines including uh, some oddball bikes there's the um there's ktm as a middleweight ktm there's also a uh, benelli 500 um that's a chinese built machine of course um even the royal enfield they're all aiming for that kind of slightly more manageable slightly less big market so Honda have obviously had a hole there and they've been looking to fill it. Um, the idea is apparently that the NC750 will now get stretched out to a 790. Now, this is partly down to the change from Euro 4 to Euro 5 emission regulations. Um, the usual response to uh, having to effectively run a run a bigger bung in the exhaust pipe uh, to comply with emissions regs is to actually make the engine a bit bigger um so you know the you'll up the power up the torque to compensate for what's been lost with the new emission regulations um so they should offset that's the theory anyway um the bike is likely to have the uh similar dct gearbox that you will find on the existing nc models um the the only thing i would really question is you know is a is a what is now nearly a uh, an 800 cc model really a middleweight um you know i don't know maybe i'm just getting old or something but back when i was uh you know a young rider uh something of the size of an 800 would actually have been bloody big motorcycle um yeah okay so obviously things move on but as i always say to people when they say oh big bikes you need big bikes you need the power to move around you do you want that, that speed you want that acceleration it makes it easier to ride and i say to people 
exactly how fast can you get around a 60 mile per hour corner? And the answer is, of course, 60 miles per hour. It doesn't really matter what you're on. A uh, bigger bike might have slightly better uh, suspension. Um, it will get there easier and quicker. But ultimately, you know, 60 miles an hour around a bend is your limit. If that's what the bend tells you, that's all that you can do. And it doesn't really matter then whether you're riding a 125 or a, uh, you know, a 2.6 litre Triumph. So, um, yeah, I kind of um, sometimes think maybe we'd all be better off riding slightly smaller bikes and just actually enjoying the ride a bit more rather than worrying too much about cubes. But hey ho. All right. OK, so. Um, where are we now? We're coming up to my third and final story for the day, which is uh, all about the um, CE approval. Um, but uh, just before we go on to that, um, just have a, a quick think about how you can support me over the uh, months uh, of the lockdown. And one thing you can still do is uh, you can still find my paperback books online lulu are still printing and you can get a selection from my uh, spotlight on lulu um, and that'll all help with the income now where are we um so yes all right where's my final story here it is so ce what does ce mean well it, it's uh, an abbreviation of french uh, expression conformité européenne um the first ce approved riding kit appeared in the mid 1990s uh that long ago i actually had a pair of uh, gloves made by um, a company called rs performance they were a uk based manufacturer and uh, they introduced the gloves uh, pretty soon after that um, regulation came in in um, 94 it was um, I went through oh, I don't know three or four pairs I think I've still got a pair stuck away somewhere as a sort of a, a spare of a spare of a spare if it rains and I get soaking wet several days on the trot um, they brought in a one-piece race suit. They also brought in a jacket, leather jacket and leather jeans. Um, they were universally regarded as extremely tough um, and equally universally regarded as very tough to break in. Um, so they weren't comfortable initially. They, they got there in the end, but you kind of had to wear them in. Um, so um, a lot of people found them very uncomfortable when they tried them on in the shop. So sales weren't fantastic, I have to say. And they, they disappeared from the market, or at least their CE kit did. I'm not sure if they're still out there. Um, anyway, the point is that the uh, this ce standard originally applied to both the clothing and body armor and there were two standards level level one um which was effectively a commuter standard that's what the kind of riding it was aimed at and level two which was aimed at professional riders so the uh, the police for example kitted themselves out with level two riding kit um in theory any garment that was sold as having a protective function should have been CE approved since 1994 and that the directive itself dated back five years earlier to 1989 so it wasn't as if the manufacturers didn't have time to, to prepare for this they had five years to get kit ready to sell by the mid-90s but RS performance apart very few manufacturers actually ever bothered um, how did they manage that? Well, they, they simply sidestepped the regulation. They started implying that their kit had no protective function. Um, the, there was a subtle change in advertising. And instead of picturing people doing um, hanging off motorcycles with their knee down and that kind of thing, um, they started showing them standing beside their bike at a beach or sipping a coffee in a cafe or something with the bike in the background on a lovely sunny day um so they were implying that the gear was protective whilst not actually overtly saying this is what it's for um nevertheless if you went to a bike shop and you looked to see what was on sale you'd find usually those 
kits, pieces of kit on the rail with a prominent C label attached to them. So that kind of, for a while, that fooled a lot of people until it started to be put around uh, in the media that, in fact, that CE label didn't apply to the garments itself. It actually applied to the body armour inside. Um, but often it wasn't made entirely clear. People, you know, there was a bit of a blurry line in the way that things were promoted. So, and moreover, if you looked actually inside the clothing, you would very often find a second label stuck stitched in to the uh the garment itself often in a place where you wouldn't normally expect to see one i had something where the this label was sort of in the in the side seam right down at the bottom so you really had to turn the jacket upside down to read it and what it would say would be something along the lines of uh, this garment is not considered to be personal protective equipment as defined by the ppe directives so basically what they were saying was yeah um, we know there is PPE directives around personal protective equipment, but this garment isn't suitable. So that was one thing. They were uh, That was an admission that the garment wasn't up to scratch. But at the same time, their own marketing departments and the motorcycle media also kind of um, was fairly um, lax in giving manufacturers a hard time on this. The marketing departments continued to describe the clothing as protective. So not surprisingly, many riders were left completely confused by the standards. Um, some were completely ignorant of the standards, um, even though I used to talk about them on CBT. Um, most riders had never heard of them. Um, and many experienced riders ignored it completely or claimed it was unnecessary bureaucracy. Um, but most were unaware of the implications of wearing non-CE kit. Now, this is where I meant to put a photograph up for you to look at. So let me just try and do that quickly. Um, this is where I meant I lost my moments with the my setup with the everything being rebooted right um hang on hang on hang on basically i'll uh, just while i'm looking for the file i'll tell you what happened i was out on a, a ride one day um nothing dramatic going on um but um Oh, there we are. I've got it. It's uh, I was nothing dramatic happening, but I was riding along a nice, nice, twisty bit of road. And um, what happened was I was being followed by another rider. Um, now, the rider behind me um, was trundling along at roughly my pace. Um, I wasn't going particularly quickly, but um, I was obviously going a bit too quick for him because he crashed behind me um and that was the result of the crash now the corner was a fairly sharp unexpected one but it really wasn't actually much of a speed bend it was uh it was about 20 25 mile per hour corner max um anyway the bike was a bit too damaged to um get it back so i am to be going in the direction he was going so i dropped him off back at his house and he got a van uh, to pick the bike up but i asked him to send me this picture i said I'd, I'd like to see the photo of your clothing well that was the knee of his rst um textiles and as you can see uh, it took a bit of a hit from the a low speed spill a uh, bit of a hit i'd say that had absolutely disintegrated on impact um, the only thing that actually protected him there was the body armor um, he got off with a, a, a small cut i think on the knee and uh, some bruising but it really was a pretty low speed spill so um, a little bit disappointing um to say the best now okay that was uh oh crikey um mid 80s mid 90s that'd be yeah that'd be late 90s early 2000s somewhere around about there um anyway so all change or at least it should be all changed two years ago new legislation came in and the idea was it would block the loopholes that to allow manufacturers to put non-protective kit onto the streets um by sticking the the label in it saying it wasn't protective kit um 
the if bikers basically wear it, it has to be protective as simple as that there's only one exception and that will be motorcycle clothing which is uh dedicated rain wear and it will have no other purpose except to keep the rain off and it will have no capacity to take any form of protector so basically it's just a shell to keep the water off um now one of the big objections to the CE stand in the first place was that testing would drive up um, costs basically to the buyer. Um, is, was that true? Well, you may remember that uh, five or six years ago, Aldi came out with a, a range of CE approved clothing uh, CE approved fabric jacket, CE approved trousers, uh, armored jeans as well. And they came out at prices well below what you'd find in most bike shops. Um, so they managed to get a level one, the old standard, out um, for you know a bargainer's price. Um, okay, so the new standard that has come out, replacing level one, level two, is a new A, double A, triple A standard. Um, that came out two years ago. Now, shortly after that came out, an article appeared online uh, to the effect that uh, RST's uh, clothing they now all been CE approved um, and the company wasn't actually having to increase any of its prices so how did that happen if testing was going to drive up the prices and was a reason for not bringing in the level one level two certification on clothing how is it with the new standard that the manufacturers can actually meet the standard and not have to change prices well one answer is those standards themselves um, if you have a look online, you'll find that RST have just released a new jacket and jeans combo. Um, it's a fabric piece of kit, and they're called the Maverick Jacket and Jeans. And the press release describes them as a four-season garment uh, with everything certified to level A. They've got all the usual bits and pieces that you expect, 360-degree uh, zip, uh, waterproof, and thermal liners, which are both removable, uh, standard reflective bits all over it, um, vents, uh, back protector, shoulder, elbow protectors, uh, knee, knee, must, knee protectors in the trousers. Uh, all to the CE level A um, for the garment and level uh, the old CE one, which still applies to the body armor. Cost uh, two hundred pounds for the jacket, basically, and one hundred and fifty for the jeans. So three fifty all in, top to bottom. Uh, sounds good. All right, how good is level A? Well. It's the lowest of the three standards. Triple A is the top standard. Um, what's level A for? Well, it's deemed suitable for urban riding. Uh, what's urban riding? Anybody's guess, really. Um, but what it implies is it's low speed. And that means it's tested at low speed. Now, again, get a little bit of tech, tech um, here that I'm going to give you. You can go and look up this online and find out a bit more about it. Testing rig is something called a Darmstadt machine. And effectively, what it does is it spins around and it has a number of arms like a spider. And each arm has a, a weighted pad. And on the end of each weighted pad at the bottom of it, the sample of material is attached. So basically, the machine spins with the sample at the bottom of these pads. And then... Having got it up to the required test speed, it's dropped onto the uh, a concrete pad and it spins around and slows down and two things are measured. First of all, whether or not the material holds and how long it takes for that hole to appear. And then secondly, if it has hold, how big the hole actually is. Now, how tough is the A classification? Well, this is the key bit really. Um, the A classification means that material in what's called zone one, and zone one will be shoulders, elbows, hips, and knees, mustn't wear through for a minimum of one second. Now, one second, think about that for a moment. With the test machine spinning at a speed of, it says 265.3 RPM. Now, for the lesser uh, impact areas, which would include 
the outside, the rest of the arm, for example, uh, the sides, uh, the back. Um, the requirement then is just half a second at an even lower speed, 147.4 RPM. Okay, so what does that mean in real life? Well, it's, it's a bit hard to say because the uh, exactly what the machine spins at doesn't exactly mean that it's what you're going to slide down the road. Uh, you know, in the same speed, it's going to be the same impact, but that's why the machine's been designed, is to try to give you sort of a level playing field. Um, but the higher speed basically equates about 40 kph or 25 miles an hour. Now, Obviously, as I said, that spinning machine is hard to compare with what happens when you hit the road surface, but what we can compare it with is the AAA standard. And the AAA standard requires that the material survives four seconds of abrasion with the machine starting to spin at 700 RPM. Now, that's effectively about 120 kilometers per hour or 75 miles an hour. So compare the two. You've got a machine that's testing for a minimum of one second at just 40 kph, 25 miles per hour, or you've got a machine spinning, testing material for four seconds at 75 miles per hour. Um, which sounds better to you? Well, I don't think it's a, not much of a, a, a decision, really, is it? Um, what's an A so what's an A-rated garment any good for? Well, it might do if you're riding a scooter in slow-moving urban traffic, um, but frankly, uh, I wouldn't actually touch it with a barge pole. Um, here's what you're not told: the clothing industry, uh, led by the giants, campaigned long and hard to have these standards reduced. Uh, the original standard was actually designed by UK researchers as well, so don't blame the EU for this. Uh, it was the UK that actually set the original standard which was adopted for the CE, uh, level one, level two. Um, who else is interested in the this work? Well, a chap called Chris Hurran. Uh, he's a materials scientist. He's based out in Australia. Um, and I worked with him on the Shiny Side Up uh, tours uh, back in 2018, 2019, when uh, over in New Zealand. And he's been doing a lot of work, independent testing on bike clothing. And his opinion is that the A classification is, is pretty inadequate. Um, he's tested uh, the materials that pass the A classification on his own testing machine, which instead of spinning, uses an abrasive belt. So the belt is continually renewed rather than polishing on the uh, spinning piece of uh, concrete surface and what he's found is that he's managed to test bog standard ordinary decent quality but ordinary denim jeans fashion jeans with no armor or anything else no reinforcements and some of those have actually passed the darmstadt test at level a so have a think about that um have a think about what you're getting with the level A standard. Have another think about that photograph that I showed you. Um, the Basically, what I would say is that I would not advise anybody on a motorcycle of any size uh, to buy a level A certified garment. Um, you have the, the level two, the level three. I would say that the level two is probably more suitable to, for commuting use. The level, the uh, AAA rather, I should say, AA and AAA. AA is probably suitable for commuting. AAA is what I would be aiming for if I was going to be riding out of town. Um, what else can I say about that, really? I think the more people that know and understand the drawbacks of the single A rating, the better, because if the people don't buy it, it will force manufacturers to up their game. But basically, um, it's up to us to understand it. So as, as Steve Vance, um Paul Varnsbury, who was one of the original workers on the standard, he used to say that the CE standard meant uh, either conformity to European or caveat emptor, which is basically buyer beware. So have a think about that. Um, right. OK, that's uh, pretty much it for today. Time is up again. Amazing how it flies by, isn't it? Um, so have a think about um, what you're doing with the standards. Um, 
I'll be back on Wednesday with uh, more news, views and tips for you. Um, in the meantime, don't forget my regular Facebook page posts, uh, which I write um, regularly. Uh, tips on Tuesday will come out tomorrow, which will be better biking skills. And there's the skills on Saturday, uh, which is, again, another, another one aimed at improving people's riding. Uh, they're all still perfectly valid just because we're not actually on the bikes doesn't mean we can't learn from them um so have a look at those and uh, for the moment um thanks for watching and hopefully i'll catch you next time out all right so if you enjoyed the show um just uh comment drop me a line and you'll be able to catch the rerun here on facebook and you will also be able to pick it up on YouTube fairly soon when I get around to putting it up. So, okay, thank you very much for your time, and uh, we'll call it a day at this point. Bye for now.